Hi, Clutter Fairy fans. Welcome to the March 26, 2019 Clutter Conversation webcast. I'm your moderator, Ed Gumnick, and I'm speaking with Gail Goddard, professional organizer and owner of the Clutter Fairy in Houston, Texas. Our topic today is Clockwork, the Clutter Fairy Guide to Time Issues in Organizing. Before we get started, a couple of notes for anyone who's joining us for the first time. Gail will present some ideas about the topic, and then she'll answer your questions. If you think of a question as we go along, please feel free to share it via chat and I'll try and make sure Gail answers it before we get away to another topic. You can also use the raise hand feature to let me know that you'd like to ask a question or make a comment yourself via audio or video. And now over to you, Gail. Hi everybody, how you doing? I can't believe it's uh, you know the late March already and boy, it is polleny like crazy out there. So this is your fair warning that if I start to cough or have an attack, don't worry, I'm just having I'm having my response to the pollen right now. <laughs> so we're going to talk about time issues as they intersect with organizing and the way that um, estimating time and managing time is a problem for accomplishing organizing tasks, working on organizing projects. So we're going to come at it from that direction today. Um, time management is kind of a national obsession, especially in the United States. We are all compelled or guilt trip to try to improve our efficiency, to be more productive, to get more done in less time. It's a constant refrain that we're supposed to squeeze more work out of less and less time. And it creates a lot of pressure on a person, right? We're really worried about being efficient, being productive here. And it's, it's a lot of pressure for somebody. But since we're not all productivity experts and we're usually talking about clearing out a linen closet or working on processing your mail, uh, we can strive to improve the process and make it easier on ourselves without worrying about um, attaining light speed of productivity. <laughs> we don't have to be like the best productivity expert ever. We can just worry about trying to make the process a little more improved for ourselves. That's a better goal, I think, for us in this context. So I'm not going to talk about the most efficient, productive things to do. We're going to talk about process improvement today. Okay. So let's start with an easy issue by looking at time as reflected in frequency of use. And as I was writing this, I remembered this example of working with a client and it's a perfect example of the concept of managing things based on, storing things based on frequency of use. So this was a client who the mother was ill and she had two small boys and there were a bunch of people coming in to help them manage the household chores because she was not, she was getting chemo treatments and she wasn't able to do it herself. And so people were coming to help. And she complained to me that the kitchen was a disaster because there was a different person doing the dishes every night and the dishes got put up all over everywhere and the kids couldn't get their own dishes down and she didn't understand what the problem was. And so I went over to the kitchen and I opened the kitchen cabinet that was above the dishwasher um, closest to the sink and I expected to find their the family dishes there and when I opened that cabinet what I found instead was a 12 place setting of wedding china <laughs> and so when they had moved into this house they had lovingly unpacked the wedding china and put it in the most accessible place possible in the kitchen and ruined those cabinets for daily use and so of course, it was impossible for people to unload the dishes and put them somewhere. They were putting them all over everywhere because the cabinets that were logical and easy access were not in place. And so once we took that wedding china and we put it in an out of the way place, I put it up in some cabinets that were up and on the left at the other end of the kitchen, you know, way up at the top where I had to get on a ladder to put them up there because nobody was using the wedding china. <laughs> nobody was pulling that stuff out and they certainly didn't want their eight and nine year old boys pulling the wedding china down and make lunch. So that stuff went way up and out of the way. And then we put the daily use stuff, the dishes that they put that they should be using all the time in those cabinets that were right above the dishwasher, right next to the sink, easy access for the boys. And after we did that, the kitchen worked much more smoothly. It was much easier for everybody to comply. They could stand at the dishwasher or in, be washing dishes and they could put away real easily the things that were constantly getting used. And so <clears throat> evaluating your storage solution based on the frequency that you're gonna use, the thing that you're trying to store is one of the criteria you should use when you're trying to decide 
What am I going to do with this thing? Where am I going to put it? If it's something that you use all the time, it needs to be in the prime real estate, which is the real estate that you can easily reach and it's easy in and out and it's in logically in the place where you're going to use it and things like that. So when you pick up something and you're trying to make a storage decision, you need to think about how frequently you're going to use it and let that be one of the criteria for placement as you go about putting things in, putting things back, setting up storage, putting in storage systems. You need to consider that. And a lot of people don't as evidenced by the people that unpack their wedding china and put it in the prime real estate. So that's the first easy topic for you. Let's see about what's next. The next thing we're going to talk about is the idea of budgeting your time for routine maintenance. This is a, a common problem that people have, and particularly after they work on a large, I've made a big push, I cleaned out the garage, or we just moved in and we unpacked all these boxes, or uh, my junk room is full and now I'm cleaning out the junk room. So when you work on a big project like that, you put all this effort and focus on it. And then when you're done, you're like, hoo, 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 done, and I'm walking away. And then you walk away and immediately the clutter starts creeping back, right? Because we don't then continue to do maintenance of the place that we just cleaned. And it's sort of like whacking your way through the jungle with a machete. You go whack, 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 and you cut a path through the vines. And as soon as you go through, the jungle starts to grow back. <laughs> And so this is what's happening when you clear a big project out and then walk away and do nothing. So managing your maintenance time and adding it into your weekly chores is a way that you're going to maintain the space and not have to go back and rebuild it and do it again. Now, truthfully, if it's an active zone in the house, you're probably going to do a big project cleanup like people do spring cleaning, right? And you do a big project and then you maintain it for a while and then you decide it's time to fluff it again, you know, reset the contents again. So that'll happen. But if you want it to last longer in between big dig outs or resets, you want to schedule that maintenance time in between. Now the difference is when you're working on a big project and you're trying to focus, you try to throw as much time as possible. You schedule a big block of time. You work on it constantly for a week or however you tackle a big project like that. Um, but when you go to do the maintenance part, you don't want to tackle it in the same way. You're not trying to stay focused on something for big chunks of time in a row. You just want to say, okay, now my weekly, weekly maintenance is I need a half an hour every night to maintain, or I need an hour twice a week to maintain or I need to spend two hours every Saturday to maintain and so slotting in that short burst repetitive time to maintain the work that you've already done is the change in focus that you need from throwing all my time and attention at it in a big block you're going to shift to short repetitive bursts and put that little bit of time into your weekly routine <clears throat> It does imply that you have to have clutter maintenance happening, happening around the clock, like, you know, all, every day of your life or, you know, a few times a week and, you know, bummer, that's how it works. But it's just like, you know, you don't wait and brush your teeth once a month, right? <laughs> you have to brush your teeth every day if you want them to stay in your head. And so this is the clutter equivalent of that. You want to do these short little bursts so that you can stay ahead of the mound of stuff that's coming into the house. The third issue to discuss is staying ahead of clutter while you're dealing with a batch, while you're in the middle of a project of old clutter. So the obvious example of this is managing your mail and paper, right? Like everybody has this problem. We ignore the paper, we ignore the mail because we don't want to deal with it because the mail is bringing to-do items, it's stuff we have to handle, it's like everything that comes in the mail is something we have to do, right? And so it's kind of like this non-stop flow to your inbox and your task list, which is annoying. So we avoid it, we don't want to deal with it, we're too tired, we come home from work, whatever. And you end up with a pile, and then it's a bigger pile, and then it's a mountain, and then you're like, oh my God, okay, I'm drowning. I have to get, I'm, this, the paper's taking over. I have to do something about it. 
So you start focusing on it and paying attention and spending time working, working, working. And in the meantime, every day that goes by, more clutter is coming in, more mail is showing up, more papers are coming home from wherever you've been. There's, there's a new crop of stuff coming in, even as you're working on the old task going out. So some people get caught in, they don't, while they're working on the backlog, they don't pay attention to what's new coming in. And so it's sort of like they're draining it out of the bucket on one side while there's more pouring into the bucket on the other side. So you feel like you're never getting ahead and it's because you're actually not getting ahead. So there's really two projects going on here. One, which is you have the project of the old backlog and you have the maintenance chore of the new incoming stuff. So we we're talking, I'm talking about this in terms of managing mail and paper, but it really applies to anything. If you are tackling an old backlog while more of that stuff is coming in, you're gonna have to pay attention to how fast you're dealing with the backlog and you're gonna have to continue to maintain the new stuff. So we get hung up where either we focus on the current stuff and ignore the backlog, which means the backlog doesn't change or we focus on the backlog and ignore the current stuff, which means as much as we take out of the backlog is being replaced by the new stuff. So you really have to focus on both pieces at the same time. You have to handle the current stuff and you have to, so allocate time to handle the current stuff and then you have to allocate time to chip away at the backlog so that you end up with, you're not adding on the front end and you're making the backlog shrink every time you touch it. So A, you gotta do those two things together in planning your time. You gotta plan time for both. And B, then you have to acknowledge that if you spend 30 minutes on and get to current stuff done, and you spend 15 minutes on the backlog, the backlog is gonna get chipped away really slowly. So you wanna try to spend as much time on the backlog after you've done the current stuff as you can. And the more time you spend on the backlog after you've done the current stuff, the faster the backlog will go away. But the trick is do the current and ship away at the backlog simultaneously. And the whole population of stuff will shrink as, as much time as you put into the, whole, the combined chores of both of those. I hope that makes sense. It's, a, it's an odd way to think about it, but you really have to acknowledge that there's two projects that have to be handled simultaneously and you got to put time into both of them in order to achieve the net loss of stuff that you're looking for, right? If you, it can be the same with towels. It's, it's, if you have a whole bunch of them and you're trying to go through and get rid of them and you, you're buying new towels on the front end while you're donating towels on the back end, you better be donating more than you're buying or your net loss will be zero. So got to pay attention to that in terms of time management. And it's something that most people, they drop the ball on. They stop looking at the current stuff so they can go on the backlog. And then they wonder why they've just been five days in a row on the backlog and they don't feel like they got anywhere. Well, it's because you've been ignoring the other side too. So do them together and you'll have a net shrinkage of the backlog. So another time perception problem we have is the way that we estimate how to deal, how long it's going to take to deal with long-term projects. So I call this clean time blindness. And what I mean by that is if you've had a junk room that's 10 years old, you've been filling it for 10 years and you've decided that now you're going to work on it. Now it's the time to make it be better. Um, we usually think, okay, I'm now going to allocate a day, a weekend, an afternoon to the junk room and I'm going to fix it all. And that's because the amount of time that you want to work on the project is not equal to the amount of time that you're actually going to need to work on the project. So we want it to be a, a short term project to solve a long term issue. The example I have for this is remodeling. If you've ever been in a remodeling project, you know what I'm talking about. The, there's a whole bunch of people here that are in are still in remodeling projects after Hurricane Harvey hit in 2016. And if you have a, all of the materials are available and the crew is at your house every day of the week for weeks in a row without interruption and everything is available to you and easy and ready, then the job's gonna take six weeks. 
but we all know that the materials don't all come and there's problems and there's delays and the team shows up for two days at your house and then they go to somebody else's house because they got five projects going or they, the tile guys can't come until the sheetrock guy is coming and he's busy and so there is no remodel project that has perfect conditions that's what i'm saying so the six weeks project which is what you are hoping and wishing because the contractor said this should take six weeks He's saying it takes six weeks if all things are perfect, which they never are. So it's the same is true for working on backlog clutter issues, big projects, clear out the garage, clear out the junk room. You're gonna want it to take a short period of time. You're gonna want it to take a weekend because that would be ideal. But the truth is, you don't know what you're gonna find. You don't realize what kind of time sucks. You're gonna get in there and find some box that has a crazy amount of stuff in it that you completely forgot about. And it's gonna take way longer than you thought it was gonna take. There's gonna be all kinds of delays about how you dispose of the stuff and where it's gonna go. And, oh, I have to call that person because that really belongs to somebody else. There's always time sucks buried in the project. And it's always gonna take longer than you are willing to do in one sitting. So the way that you have to think about scheduling a project like this isn't how much time do I hope I can complete this project in. It's more that how much time can you focus on it in one sitting where you stay focused and you have good energy and you have the physical ability to stand up and you're paying attention. <clears throat> because it, any long-term project, any big project is going to be larger than your amount of your willingness to focus and stay alert and stay on task and stay upright. So you don't want to plan <laughs> about how long you think it's going to take. You want to plan what is your time slot for willingness to work? How long can you be there and be focused on it? And then you want to schedule those time slots if it's two hours, if it's three hours, if it's 90 minutes, if it's four hours, if you're super energetic and you can stay on it for four hours, awesome. But you want to schedule, figure out what your willing focus time is and then schedule those until the project is complete. <clears throat> because the fact that you can stay on it for three hours doesn't matter if the project's going to take 19 hours. You can't get it all. You can't squeeze a 19 hour project into a three hour slot. So you just want to know once the project outstrips your ability for one session of focusing, then you just want to know what that one session is. And then you want to schedule that session over and over again until you get the project done. And you likely won't know how long it's going to take. You won't be able to predict that you'll be done in six weeks or six months or whatever, depending on how dense it is. I've worked on people's houses where I've gone once a week or twice a week for a year to get all the way around the house and get through everything. So depending on how crazy it is at your house or how big the project is you're trying to tackle, you just need to figure out how long you're willing to stay on it in one sitting and then just open-ended say, I'm gonna do this three hours once a week or twice a week until the project is done and that's a better way to manage the time and think about the time and be willing to keep at it <clears throat> if you dive into the garage and you get three hours in and you all you've done you've run out of steam and all you've done is make it worse then you're going to be really unlikely to want to come back to it <laughs> so <laughs> you really want to just know that you're going to work for that three hours at a time and then walk away and come back and be doing that again and again and again until the end this is a way to change your expectation of yourself and your expectation of the project so that is it's realistic and it's not discouraging and distressing to you. What can I say? Clutter takes a long time depending on how long you've been neglecting it. Okay, that's clean time blindness. So the last thing that I wanna talk about today is procrastination. This is a big one. And actually when we started talking about how do we talk about time and time management, it was the first thing that we both thought of like, oh my gosh, we have to talk about procrastination. And here's the thing. If I had a silver bullet for how to deal with procrastination, I would be a millionaire and we would not be doing this right now <laughs> because I would have sold my magic pill and we would all be at a beach somewhere. But 
the thing about procrastination is it's really, it reflects that we are avoiding things we don't want to face. We are not wanting to do things that don't feel like a rewarding experience. We are staying away from things that feel overwhelming or frightening or boring or any project that doesn't feel like like when you know when you know you're going to have a good time you run to it to go have a good time right but this is the definition of i have to work on this project that makes me want to barf i have to work on this project that makes me feel inadequate i have to work on this project that is so annoying or boring or whatever whatever the thing is that keeps you from wanting to do it and so we procrastinate and we ignore it doesn't make the project go any better i have to say and really the only way to get past that that I know of from experience is to just find the one step that you can do right now, the one inch forward of progress that you can do on that procrastinating project. The example that I have here is I saw this article, um, it's been a long time now actually, about this woman and how she, she needed to work on her exercise like she needed to do exercise for health management and weight loss and she was terrible and had never done it before she was terrible at it she felt like she was terrible at it and so she said to herself okay i'm just going to walk one more step today than i did yesterday and so she literally started the front door and walked a step and then went back in the house and the next day she walked two steps and she went back at the house and she kept repeating, repeating, repeating three steps, four steps, five steps until at some point she had gotten to the end of the driveway. <laughs> but she kept doing that increase. And clearly it was a very slow incremental inching forward of her progress. But every time she did that, she got a little bit farther. And, you know, at some point she was out walking all around the neighborhood doing her thing because she had finally built up the capacity to go a whole bunch of steps, right? So that to me was this tiniest little, she, she was a perfect example, one step and then stop. That was her day. That was her goal for the day. You know, you can't get any smaller of an increment than that in terms of exercising. Like I'm going to walk one step more than I did yesterday. But for her, it was a slow incremental imp increase in exercising that over the long haul really got her somewhere and she became somebody who was an exerciser and a walker by starting in that place and that to me is a perfect illustration of even if you start with the smallest possible incremental movement forward on your task you can still make progress and sometimes and we all have that experience of once we finally make ourselves do one little step then we're into it and we, we actually are willing to do two or three steps before we walk away. Sometimes doing the one step is overwhelming enough and we stop and we walk away. Okay, so give yourself the permission to just move it forward one step. And if you have a burst of energy and you're actually able to move it forward four or five steps, super cool. And at some point you will, will realize that you've been working on this project now and it's not as scary as it used to be and it's not as overwhelming as it used to be and you do have some skill sets to solve the problem or you know where your deficits are and you can go ask for help in certain areas and it is all about climbing over the emotion that gets in the way of starting something you don't want to do and once you get going you'll realize that you can do it and it is okay and you will accomplish something but taking that one step and making that one step to be the smallest possible bit that lets you move forward until you're willing to take a bigger step or multiples of little steps until you're ready to get the momentum rolling a little bit more. Even that one step forward on the porch, <laughs> you know, it took her two weeks to get to the end of the driveway. Even that little bit of increment got her moving and got her going in the habit and got her uh, attacking the problem over and over again until she will really accomplish something and she really got somewhere. And you can do this with your project as well and you can do it with the clutter. If the clutter is overwhelming, you just have to find one step that you're willing to take towards that process 
And if you make one step today, call it a win. If that's as far as you can get, okay. But it's possible to make a little, in, make a little inroad against the procrastination and eventually get your, you know, get the train up to speed and rolling down the track. We all have to climb over. We all have to, you know, make ourselves do something. And sometimes the only thing you can make yourself do is take one step forward on the porch. <laughs> so if that's what you can do, great. And Ed would put it this way. He would say, any action is better than no action. The slightest amount of forward motion is better than zero. And that is the truth. And it's somewhere along the way, you've made enough motions that you realize, ah, yeah, this isn't as scary as I thought. Why did, and, you know, I've heard people say to me, why did I wait so long? Why did, why was I so afraid of this? Why did I think I couldn't do this? Well, you know, you did. And you just have to know that while you're sitting in that feeling of, oh my God, I can't do this. Oh my God, this is scary. I don't know what to do. You can say to yourself, I may not think I know what to do, or I may actually not know what to do, but I can pick a step. And maybe the step is, call and ask somebody for help <laughs> like maybe making that phone call is your step but even while you are feeling those feelings of oh my gosh i'm ignoring i'm ignoring because i'm panicking i'm overwhelmed i'm afraid i'm whatever you can recognize that you're in that place and you can also say to yourself i've had this experience before and i know what happens if i just do something I can get the ball rolling and I will, it will not be as bad as I think. I will get on the other side and go, why did I wait so long? And that one little step helps you shift your perception. It helps you remember, oh yeah, if I just get in motion, it'll be okay. So that's my, that's my one tip about procrastination from the non-expert because sister has an issue too. <laughs> there, you know, everybody has their projects they don't want to work on, right? So um, I'm in the boat with you, but I'm, I've done it often enough that I know, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm messing around, I'm avoiding this, but I know that I, if I do something, I'll get somewhere and, and I will figure out a solution and I will make forward progress. And, you know, you hopefully, as you get older, you learn that if you have this experience often enough, you learn to try to get over the procrastination before there's a screaming red alarm and the deadline is six hours away, right? You try to get onto it a little bit earlier so that your stress level isn't so high. And, you know, this is, this comes with practice and <laughs> makes perfect, right? <laughs> so that is my, you know, conversation about time and decluttering. <clears throat> and I want to know if anybody has any questions that they want to ask about time. I don't see any questions on the chat board, so no one has given us any yet. But um, overwhelmed. <laughs> I'll add to I'll add to what you said. Um, a couple of things. One is the um the thing I I I think I've quoted it to you from one of my coaching clients. Um, this is a client who is a you know life and business coach, and right. she says, um, I'm gonna get it wrong, but I think she says it as action creates clarity. So even if you're not sure what you should do next or what you should do first, it's better to do something than to sit there doing nothing. And Because um, even if the something is wrong, it <laughs> then clarifies what your step should be instead. Exactly. Even if you've done something something that was not the ideal thing, as long as it's something that you wanted to get done anyway, you know, it's like, I'm not sure where, how to start on clearing off my desk. So I'm going to empty the dishwasher. Well, you know, at least your dishwasher's empty, right. you know, <laughs> and, um, and you've probably been thinking about your desk the whole time you were emptying your dishwasher and you might have a little bit better idea because you've, you've stopped being so in your head about it. Well, you, and, you've and you've gotten in some kind of motion regardless. Yeah, you're in motion. And then um, your story about the woman taking a, a single, adding a single step a day, um, I had a similar experience. I was walking at the park every day, and a friend of mine who desperately needed to be getting more exercise said, I would like to come with you. And um, so what we did was we just 
we walked as far as, you know, we, we walked a comfortable distance and then we, I made a note of where we were by the street lights because the loop we were on, there were, there was a street light. There were about often, yeah. 30 street lights a mile. And so there's a street light about, about every 180 feet. And I would just make a note of the street light we were at. And then we'd turn around and we'd go back to the car. And the next time he went with me, we would go one street light farther. Hey. And like every time we, you know, so we're, Every every time he was walking about you know 360 feet more than he did the time before, and uh, you know it's a cliche, it worked, right? The journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step, but it, <laughs> I mean it's really true. I, I'm a really strong believer in incremental progress. Right, so, and the truth is when you're feeling super when you're really procrastinating, incremental progress is like the first roll of the train down the track. Like it just yeah. starts momentum going. Yeah. Well, that's great too. The train down the track, you know, trains don't just like suddenly barrel along at, yeah, at into, their best speed. An hour, yeah. They start barely even crawling. And uh, yeah. April says, my problem is I will set time aside, but I get sidetracked and don't seem to get as far as I could, especially if I try to do a longer session. So, if the longer, is, so I'm wondering, so the first question that comes to mind is, do you think of yourself as ADHD? So you're saying that I get sidetracked and I'm wondering if that means that you are ADHD. And so it's easy for you to get sidetracked. And so part of what I would suggest is, A, I would set timers for yourself so that there's something clicking in the background or you can, like if you go to the time timer, T-I-M-E-T-I-M-E-R.com, and you can get an app on your phone so that there's a sleeve, you know, there's the clock and there's a, you pull a sleeve down for 20 minutes and it's red and then the sleeve gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So there's a visual movement of the clock that you can see besides the arms, you can see the sleeve shrinking. So um, this is a way to sort of create an artificial pressure against yourself to stay focused is by having the timer running. Um, and then the second thing is, um, Ed will talk about this in more detail, but there's a technique called the Pom Pomodoro technique. Oh, he's going to the time timer thing on the screen. Excellent. Um, <clears throat> so if you go to the Pomodoro technique, which is you work for 25 minutes and you take a five minute break and you work for 25 minutes and you take a five minute break. It's not natural for us to feel like we can stay focused for four hours in a row. The truth is you're going to stop. You're going to get water. You're going to go to the bathroom. You're going to get distracted by paper, whatever. So don't aim for continuous focus for four hours. Aim for 25 minutes and a five minute break where you let your, you like stay focused for 25 minutes. And that's sort of a natural ability that we, our brains can do. And then you spend five minutes going, okay, I can't think about this for five minutes. And you give yourself a break and then you start another 25 minute session. And so <clears throat> it's a way for you to get four hours in, in 25 minute increments and with five minute breaks in between all the way around. And so I would try tackling it that way instead. Hopefully that helps. Yeah. We've, we've said, we've mentioned that one before and I, I kind of stumbled onto the Pomodoro method on my own before I ever heard of the Pomodoro method, because right. I just, I found that, and well, I guess it sort of makes sense, you know, just we think in terms of hours and half hours. And I found that 25 minutes was a very reasonable amount of time. You could, it wasn't so little that you couldn't, that you couldn't accomplish anything meaningful, but it wasn't so big that it's really scary. And so I, to this day, I do that if I have a big project that, is overwhelming and has a lot of moving parts and I'm not sure I'm, I'm you know I'm thinking about the 18 hours it's going to take me to get the whole thing done and that makes it hard to even start and so I just say okay today I'm going to spend 25 minutes on that thing and well, I set a timer around it too that you know 25 minutes is about the time that your brain can actually stay focused <laughs> and, and be in its most effective mode too. Like, you know, your ability to stay focused nonstop, like we're not robots, right? And we can't go, okay, I'm going to stay focused on this for six hours straight without break. Like your brain isn't designed to do that. And, but 25 minutes seems to be um, a scientifically 
um, approachable, like it's a version that's supported by how your brain functions. And so, you know, but I tell people all the time, <clears throat> set the timer for 10 minutes. If you can't get like, this is the, the step, set it for five minutes, set it for 10 minutes, set it for 15 minutes. Don't make the, the, um, the request for your own time. Don't make the goal beyond your capacity. If you're really procrastinating and you can't stay focused, set it for 10 minutes and see if you can stay focused for 10 minutes. Like that's all you got to do. And, and then the 10 minutes goes by and you can, you know, add it, do it again. If you feel like you're okay. And especially if you're just starting out, if you have been, if you've kind of been stuck in some bad habits for a long time and you're trying to shift to some better ones, be, be gentle with yourself and, <laughs> and, if what you can manage is three minutes, then do three minutes. And Whatever, when, and, and, and celebrate you, the win. And if you've done three minutes every day for a week, then the next week you might find that four minutes or five minutes is, is, in your, is within your reach. And, and this is, we've had this conversation about your exercise regimen. I mean, you walk every day and your game about walking is everything counts. Yeah. So if you walk, half a block it counts as walking you walked today if you went a half a block now clearly you walk way more than that but we, even when you had surgery on your eye and you're supposed to be laying on the couch and not moving so the gas bubble does you know even in that you would stand up and walk to the end of the block and back sometime during that day yeah so everything counts everything is forward motion if you do something <laughs> And something is always better than nothing and being okay with, you know, you don't have to say I've done nothing and now I've done everything. Now I'm cooking with gas and I'm blowing at it and going, you just want to go from doing nothing to starting the train rolling a little bit. And just know that the more successful days that you accumulate over time at making forward motion, you know, somewhere down the road, you really will be cooking with gas and you'll be blowing and going. But, you know, you have to give yourself the, you know, the steps in between without judgment and without giving yourself a hard time that you aren't already blowing and going, right? And people that have that sense of, you know, it needs to be perfect. I don't get started because it needs to be perfect. It's like, you know what? All the steps are steps on the way to getting it perfect. Like you won't... You can aim for that target, but there's hardly anything in the world that goes from zero to perfect in a straight line with no issues and no mistakes. Like that's, it's just not realistic. Well, and perfect there's only lasts, line. perfect only lasts until the mailman comes again anyway. <laughs> right, exactly. That's exactly right. So, this is, this is the realm where, you know, judging yourself is the enemy to overcoming procrastination. If you're procrastinating and you're judging yourself for what you're doing towards getting rid of procrastination, then you are destined to fail. So you have to make steps and you have to be nice to yourself for making steps. And then you will make progress. It will really happen. Anybody else have any questions? Are we good? No one has piped in with any more questions. So I think we'll wrap it up. And, okay. Um, before we go, we want to let everyone know about our upcoming events. Our next meeting will be on Thursday, April 25th at 7 p.m. We'll meet in person at a healing collective in Houston. If you're in Houston, come see us. Live and in person. Visit cfhou.com slash hccm1904. I'll put that on the bottom of the video and I'll paste it into the chat right now for everybody watching live. Our next online event will be on Tuesday, May 28th at 12.01 p.m. Central Time. YouTube viewers, we'd love for you to join us live. Visit cfhou.com slash 1905 for information about how to participate in the meeting. If you'd like to receive notifications about upcoming events, we invite you to join the meetup group at meetup.com slash Houston hyphen clutter hyphen coaching. You can also follow us on, on Facebook or subscribe to our mailing list. We'd love to hear from you, so please send us your questions and topic suggestions in the YouTube comment in the YouTube comments, and you can always reach us through our website at clutterfairhouston.com. 
thank you guys for coming. I appreciate it. And we love talking to you and we'll be back again to talk some more. Thanks. Bye.